Hello? Everybody can hear me? All right, good. Good morning. How's everybody doing? That's about the level of enthusiasm I expected for 9 a.m., so that's all right. I would say you're a lovely audience, but I can't really see you very well <laughs> because of the light. Um, actually, I should mention, uh, actually, I, uh, you probably saw at the door, uh, we're giving out the raffle tickets, so we'll be giving away Amazon Echo at the end of the presentation. So kind of stick around for that. Um, and I, I, today, uh, we're here to, uh, to talk about turnkey open stack, so yeah. I'll let Karthik kind of take that away. Thanks, Jeremy. Hey, uh, hi, folks. Good morning, uh, and welcome to uh, the session on turnkey OpenStack. Um, we know you have a lot of other sessions to attend, so thanks for taking time to come here. Um, as Jeremy mentioned, we will be uh, giving away an Amazon Echo uh, at the end of the session, so please stick around for that. Um, we've been working on a project called Project Caspian for the last year and a half. Uh, we'd like to show you what we have done so far. Um, it's about making OpenStack turnkey, not just from a setup and deployment standpoint, but from operations and ongoing operations. So, um, so this is the agenda for the session today. Uh, I'll give you, uh, you know, a few words about what problem are we trying to solve? Uh, why did we think it was important for us to solve this problem? Um, I'll show you a few demos of the of the project that we. Uh, have been working on. There's a big unveil at EMC World next week, uh, so you'll see and hear more from us next week. Um, we'll also talk about the trade-offs uh, as we went through this, this effort, and then Jeremy will take over and then talk about uh, design and challenges. Um, sounds like a plan? Okay. So why did we choose to go down this path? Um, we realize that many organizations do not have the time or the appetite to put all of these things together. Um, uh, we have heard repeatedly from many organizations that they're very interested in OpenStack, uh, but it's just incredibly complex. Um, design takes weeks, if not months. Uh, and even at the end of the day, uh, you do not have a very stable uh, OpenStack uh, that's scalable, that, you know, that you can upgrade, and so on and so forth. So I, I think many vendors are trying to solve this problem. Uh, as, as are we. Uh, an off-quoted statistic uh, is that IT organizations spend almost 70% of their budgets just trying to keep the lights on. Um, so uh, it is important for us to solve, uh, you know, not just bringing up the OpenStack environment uh, in a very simple and elegant manner, but also making sure that uh, you are able to operate it with the same uh, ease of use. Uh, in short, many organizations are really looking for an easy button. Um, so, when we started out this project, we had two goals. Um, the first one was, um, can we get to uh, an OpenStack cloud in less than a day? Now, what that means is, could you get push-button deployment? Uh, could we make your maintenance operations very simple and easy, like change the personalities of servers, replace parts? Uh, can you have your users start uh, using the environment almost immediately? And can you all do this uh, in a very easy manner? Uh, simplicity is always at the forefront of everything that we try to do with this project. Internally, we call this the iPhone experience so that that guides us from a design principle uh, in terms of how we want to build this. Uh, the hardware comes in, and it's wheeled in, and it's plugged into the network. Um, how quickly can we get the uh, OpenStack environment up and running? So that's goal number one. Goal number two is, you know, in, in the life of running this entire cloud, it's going to be running for three, four, five years, or, or hopefully longer. Uh, standing up a cloud itself uh, may not me mean, uh, you know, from a time perspective, uh, may not be that big of a deal. But like I said, we've seen organizations repeatedly, uh, you know, struggle with even getting to that stage. So that's goal number one. Goal number two is, while that's all great, uh, can you make it enterprise ready? Is it secure? Is it highly available? Uh, many organizations want to start small and scale out. They don't have big budgets to go after setting up multiple racks, so um, they really want to start small and scale out. Uh, can you build in multi-tenant out of the box, uh, monitoring across the entire stack, uh, and single pane of glass management? And at the end of the day, um, Upgrades and patches, uh, you know, patch management. It's very critical. You have tons of new projects coming in uh, at a pace that 
many IT organizations are not traditionally used to, how do you take advantage of that? How do you build that all in from a design perspective um, uh, you know, and, and make it very simple for the IT admin? Um, so let's see what that looks like. So what I'm going to do is show you a series of demos. Uh, what we're going to do is show you how the OpenStack environment is deployed, how it is monitored, and how it's uh, scaled out and you know, elastic, elastically scaled out and brought, brought back in. So uh, when, a, when the system is wheeled in, uh, what a customer sees is uh, a system with no personality. All we have is a few control plane nodes, uh, and everything else is empty. You see about 17 of these uh, servers, um, but nothing's really set up. So what we do is an IT admin would then go in and say, oh, I'm going to stand up my OpenStack cloud. And what he's going to do is just go and click a few buttons uh, and say, deploy OpenStack. Um, it's really as simple as that. And what that happen when that happens, in the background, we configure everything from, from all the OpenStack projects, Nova, uh, you know, Neutron, and also the, uh, you know, the scale I.O. Uh, software technology that we use for storage. Um, and all of this happens within a few minutes. Uh, you see that we have Kibana integrated for log management. You'd also see that, uh, I don't know if it's clear on the slide, but the four-node system uh, in real time takes about, uh, about four minutes. Uh, and what happens after that is uh, the, the end user, the admin, sorry, just one second. Can then go ahead and start, um, you know, adding users to this uh, cloud. You know, we have support for Active Directory and LDAP. Sorry, I'm having some technical glitches. Okay, so the user can then go in and start creating uh, tenants within the organization. You know, import users from Active Directory and LDAP, uh, and at the end of the day, uh, the user. Uh, or the admin uh, is able to now provision the cloud for end users to take advantage of. Uh, and then the end users can start using Horizon and start deploying workloads and so on and so forth. So that's uh, step number one. Now, once that is done, um, you know, in steady state, uh, the admin can then go in and monitor the entire cloud. Um, we have monitoring built in top to bottom, right from your OpenStack environment all the way down to the hardware. Um, you can take a look at the infrastructure at various levels, the storage, the network, uh, the compute nodes. Uh, you also take a look at the uh, OpenStack environment from an instances standpoint. What you see as cloud compute is really the, uh, uh, the compute environment uh, powered by OpenStack. So, so that's what uh, the end user uh, or the admin can do. Uh, and we also have the ability to monitor for every single organization what it looks like. So you see an accounts tab there, and the video will show that in a few seconds, you can actually drill down to a particular organization and see what their environment looks like. Uh, so it's, it's very powerful. The admin can drill down uh, to the depths and, and figure out what's going on. Once that is done, let's assume that uh, the uh, operator wants to scale out the cloud. Um, all he has to do the same thing. Just go select a few nodes and then expand the cloud. So you can do this non-disruptively. There are no scripts and configuration things to do. All you have to do is just go back to the, to the environment, just select a few nodes, and voila, you have uh, an expanded system. Um, so as you can see from four nodes, uh, we go up to uh, six nodes at the end of this process. And the same with you know, shrinking the cloud. Uh, if you want to get it down uh, to a few nodes, what you have to do is just live migrate those VMs, and because we have uh, scale I/O storage, which is um, which is kind of powering this entire environment, uh, we can live migrate the VMs over, take the nodes out, uh, and you can get your uh, you can elastically bring it down. You like that? Yeah. Okay. Um, as part of this effort, uh, and and. Jeremy will talk a lot more about the design uh, and, and show you uh, under the covers. Uh, a lot of conscious decisions went into um, how we built this entire thing. So we focused on simplicity and robustness. Uh, and if you want to do that, you cannot get flexibility. I mean, that's, it doesn't work that way. 
So we chose ease of management, installability, uh, over customization. You get uh, what comes with this with the system. Again, going back to the whole iPhone experience, um, you know, it is exactly like that. You know, you don't get choices. You get a few choices uh, in terms of the hardware you select, but you do not get a lot of uh, different components that you want to put in. Um, that means that we have a curated set of OpenStack projects that we support. We have a bar that we set fairly high. It has to be stable. It has to be uh, well adopted by the community. Uh, and those are the ones that will go in uh, as we build this thing out. Uh, and of course, a predefined network topology. Um, a lot of the design um, that we do, uh, you know, a lot of what you saw is enabled by uh, very conscious design choices. Um, and I'll just highlight two of them, and Jeremy will take over and, and explain more. The first one is uh, the use of our uh, software-defined storage, Scale.io. Uh, you know, and you start, that enables you to start small. We run it in a hyper-converged configuration, so that enables you to start small and scale out. Uh, but probably the most important one is the use of Docker containers for running everything. Uh, our control plane is all containerized. Our entire OpenStack environment is containerized. Uh, to talk about that and more, Jeremy. So as Karthik mentioned, you know, we're running everything in Docker containers, not just you know, the OpenStack services, but a lot of the custom services we had to build to make this an enterprise-ready uh, solution. Uh, what we're really shooting for there was, you know, uh, eliminating the conflicts and dependencies between services. So, you know, we have huge flexibility and and uh, and around upgrades, they're a lot smoother because we're using the containers. You know, we have base OS upgrades separated from you know service upgrades. We can upgrade individual containers independently, uh, and you know, we'll 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 talk more on that. But I think using Docker in general has also helped us to be able to iterate more quickly over the project uh, and, 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 and complete it in a faster time. Um, we're using uh, notably Ansible for lightweight container management. So the choice there is kind of, you know, why, why would you use it? It's kind of the same reason many people might choose Ansible, you know, no extra, Im you know, imposed architecture on the platform, no agents, everything's simply over you know, SSH. It's easier for our you know, team two to set up and, and script. And we'll talk more about these as, as we uh, go along. Um, for the scale I.O., we'll, we'll talk more a uh, little bit about the components and the detail there. Uh, but scale I.O. in general is just software uh, defined storage. So you can pull together and leverage your disks in your infrastructure. And you're basically creating a scalable, uh, elastic, resilient virtual SAN. And that's at a fraction of the cost of like a traditional SAN. So that's kind of like the reason why we're using that. And plus, it's redundant, storage, reliable, fault tolerant, especially uh, the way we have it set up with uh, the containers. So we'll get into that in a bit. Uh, and as Karthik mentioned, in order to create a tested, kind of tried and true, reliable system, uh, you know, there, one of the sacrifices was a little bit of the flexibility uh, for the hardware. So it's predefined hardware configuration. So just kind of how I want to finish this last half of, of the presentation. We're just going to talk about containerizing uh, OpenStack, uh, talk about some of the challenges uh, we hit there, we'll talk about you know, Scale.io software-defined storage. And then at the end, we'll mention kind of four uh, miscellaneous challenges that we had to address along the way because of uh, design. So containerizing OpenStack. Um, this slide just kind of highlights basically what, what we mean there, what we're doing. So we basically have the base Linux OS, and we have you know, any number of images. And this, this isn't representative of all of the images that are possible, but you know, we have load, load balancer image, RabbitMQ, you know, UI, uh, log, you know, custom logging containers and things. So there's a lot of stuff uh, here that's going on. Uh, notably here for the OpenStack images we have, uh, we do those in kind of a unique way where we actually pass in a, a parameter at the time that the container will start up. So if you want like a glance container from your OpenStack image, we say, you know, pass in a role to a boot uh, script that basically will create a glance container with those services running in it. Now, importantly to note here is because many of our containers are actually running multiple services, we're actually using Supervisor D to kind of monitor and maintain those which is actually nice because we're, it's allowing a little bit of self-healing the way we have it set up because 
we actually have it configured to restart services if they went down for any reason. And by the same note, we have Docker uh, set up so that we'll restart any uh, container that if it happened to crash for any reason. So as Karthik mentioned, we, we kind of set the bar high on what projects we wanted in. We wanted in, you know, initially the, 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 the most uh, uh, reliable projects here. Um, and one of the things that Docker also is going to allow us to, to do in the future is more easily pull in those other services that we want to add, uh, you know, as time goes on. And it also, using the containers allows us to uh, uh, support enterprise-ready features such as the ability to transfer nodes. You know, if you have a node here and you wanted to transfer all the services away to another node, that's uh, much easier to do the way we have things set up, especially with uh, Ansible uh, orchestrating that. Uh, but just to kind of walk through some of this, so you know we have RabbitMQ clustered, mirror queues, database is MySQL, Galera. Uh, uh, their the con MySQL containers are all Active Master, and as Karthik also mentioned, we're relying on Scale.io for you know backend for the Glance and Cinder and Nova, and we'll talk about some of that a in a bit as well. And Neutron, Open vSwitch, VXLAN. I should mention at this point though that when when we started out this project initially. You know, we were focused on the Kila release at the time, but we're actively implementing, uh, working to implement Vitaka at, at current. And I mention that because some of the things that we'll hit on some of the challenges, you, you'll note, uh, it's a little bit more uh, geared towards uh, Kilo. So this slide is just, uh, we'll, we'll walk through it a bit, but kind of laying out the landscape of the, the architecture in terms of nodes and then what containers look like and where they are. But once again, this is not representative of all the containers you would see because there's things here like UI, logging. We're using Elasticsearch and things like that, so that more containers there. But you know, to fit on the slide, that, that I think this gives you a pretty good sample of, of what we're doing. Um, and of note here, you'll, you'll see that containers are pretty much in triplicate. You know, that's for fault tolerance and redundancy sake. And we have things behind load, everything behind load balancers. We're making sure there's no single point of failures uh, with services. Now, what would you see here in green are these platform nodes. So what we're doing is basically, you can think of it as like seeding an environment with three platform nodes. You can think of it as like a control plane or a control nodes or ho however. It's basically like where the like Nova controller and Neutron controller and things like that are going to be running. And from there, we're, we're allowing to spin up n number of compute nodes. And I should also point out here on this slide that um, you know, there's these scale I.O. components we'll get into in a bit, like scale I.O. MDM, gateway. Uh, those things are also uh, spread across multiple platform nodes, again, for fault tolerance and redundancy sake. Um, also, also worth noting here is that uh, scale I.O. SDS, which we'll talk about briefly in a moment, is on the compute nodes because typically the disks are on the compute node side, and so we're pulling, pulling together the disks from the compute nodes. The SDS, as you'll see, is what uh, manages the back-end I.O. operations. But first, I just want to, before we switch over to the storage and scale I.O. a little bit, I want to talk about some of the challenges uh, we faced along the way uh, when you know going down this path of containerizing OpenStack. So, well, we initially, starting out, we knew about these four you know things would be challenges going in. So it wasn't like any of these were surprises. Uh, but to walk through them, you know, it needed a way to, to manage configuration and service metadata. So if you think back to that diagram that I showed, uh, uh, the Docker one where we, you know you pass in the role to say this image become Glance container or Nova container, uh, one of the things that happens there in that process is that there is a uh, container that's uh, it's basically a metadata service, just has a REST API that we talk to when the container comes up and it pulls its configuration metadata. So for instance, if you were gonna run a Nova controller container, what's going to happen is that it's going to uh, talk to that metadata service and get the configuration items such as like CPU allocation ratio, memory allocation ratio, scale I.O., plug-in, configuration, and it's going to set up the uh, services. Now, dynamic node inventory. So as you can see, one of the things with Docker containers is that, you know, you ha they c it's kind of like you, you you got to control or know where they are, right? So one of the things we have to do is know uh, where every you know three containers are on any given node, and 
And another thing we have to know is for the nodes themselves, like what do they look like? You know, what kind of disks do they have? Uh, what size are they? Which ones can, are, you know, are taken by an OS? Which ones actually can be used by Scale.io? So that information is stored into another service, uh, which also can be uh, uh, talked with uh, via REST API to kind of control that dynamic node inventory. And that leads me kind of to the third challenge here, which was with the containerization, you know, we needed a way to pass in custom variables and, and, and this dynamic inventory uh, to Ansible. So one of the ways we did that was just have a container that was a REST API wrapper around Ansible so we could do that. And that also, you know, allowed us to, to have help, help separate this concept out of, you know, platform or management plane versus compute plane and allows us to programmatically execute the playbooks that we need, such as if we need to upgrade, uh, a, you know, the services, we can launch an upgrade playbook. If we need to transfer the services or add more nodes, we can run the appropriate playbooks. And the fourth point here, so typically with any of the containers, there's probably something you want to uh, persist to disk or ha have survive if you brought a container down and, and back up or something like that. So one of the challenges here is like, you, you know, you want to do that, but then you also want to support those enterprise ready features such as, you know, the ability to transfer all, all my services from node A to node B. So a little bit of a balancing act. So one of the ways uh, we actually meet that challenge is by actually using Scale.io. And I, just to give you, I guess, two quick examples of that. So for Glance uh, in particular using Scale.io, so as I mentioned, you know, we have the services in, in triplicate here. So any one Glance container, uh, only one Glance container at a time is going to be running the Glance services. And we have like a, a clustering mechanism or something to, to have that happen. But the important point here is that there's a Scale.io volume that's going to be mounted to that particular container that's actually running the, those Glance services. Now, if that container crash and one of the others intelligently takes over or we want to transfer the active one to somewhere else, the volume just needs to get mounted to the other node. Same thing with kind of lo Nova li Live Migration. So we're actually facilitating no Nova Live Migration by using Scale.io for the same reasons. If you want to migrate a VM from node A to node B, then uh, the volume can uh, be mounted to the other nodes. So I've talked about Scale.io components and things in here, and you're probably still wondering what some of this stuff is that you've seen on some of these slides. So just to briefly cover some of it, in case you're not aware, uh, you probably saw S, uh, S Scale.io SDC on the slide. So that's, you can think of it as a client, simple enough. Uh, Scale.io data server, you can kind of think of it as a server, but it's really performing the back-end I.O. operations, and the SDC is going to talk to the SDS. Metadata manager is like, kind of like the brain, because uh, it's doing, you know, has it, uh, managing the configuration, the volume mapping uh, information, uh, error handling, things like that. Gateway, simply think of it as like a REST API. And since I said all that, this just kind of lays out what that would actually look like uh, in terms of uh, Nova Compute and Cinder uh, services. So we have our Scale I.O. Uh, plugins uh, talking to the REST Gateway. SDS, like I said, is going to be talking to uh, the uh, SD, uh, excuse me, SDC is going to talk to the SDS for the volume mapping. And th the real challenge here was just doing the legwork. You know, of getting Scale.io implemented, you know, getting the drivers created and, and things like that. So some more of the uh, real challenges that I want to talk about, though, uh, here uh, to, before we uh, reach the end is security upgrades monitoring Keystone v3. So we'll talk about a few points in uh, each of these. So from a security standpoint, you know, you want to, you want to disallow a access from your VMs to certain things that are running on those platform nodes that I talked about, you know, especially like custom services and things that VMs have no, no reason or right to, uh, to talk to. One of the, the challenges there is you, you have to understand, though, how the Docker networking uh, plays a part in this because if, not, if, you're, if you're not careful, what you could find yourself I in is a situation where you had a Docker container, uh, or you had a container in uh, Docker networking mode running on 
the same node as a neutron network container, and you realize, oh, the VM still can access this, even though I put in my IP tables that, you know, to disallow access to a port that was open on that container. And the reason for that is just how Docker networking mode works and the IP tables are configured there. The same thing doesn't happen if you have a, con a container in host networking mode, you know, on, uh, on the same node as the neutron network uh, container. So there's something, you know, something to keep in mind there that you have to understand those uh, inner workings a little bit before you start trying to do things with IP tables to disallow access. Uh, another thing is just authorization issues in OpenStack. So if you think back to what I mentioned earlier, when we initially started out on the project, it was focused on the Kilo release. Uh, and like I said, we're act you know, actively doing the talk now, but at the time in Kilo, and, and I'll call out Horizon here a bit, you know, there's this hard-coded admin logic you know, that, that Horizon's gonna use to do things like know when to display the admin page you know, for a user that logs in. There isn't really any, there wasn't any really concept of like project admin, domain admin, and things like that. So one of the things we had to do was just go in and 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 do that work of, you know, make, making those concepts into policy files and things so that we can have more clear defined uh, roles for uh, access. So upgrades. So what are the things you want to do when, you know, you're trying to create an upgrade service? Well. Some of those here, you want to minimize service disruptions, obviously, uh, a big one. Another is just intelligently upgrading so you don't trip over your own foot, you know, or possibly have a situation where you would trip over your own foot while you were upgrading. And we'll get into that in a bit. Uh, fault tolerant upgrades, obviously. Uh, the first one, uh, minimizing service disruptions, that's more uh, Ansible kind of helping us there because Ansible, uh, we're actually using things like, you know, the ability to serialize, you know, actions of the playbook on, on certain containers and things like that, so we can do rolling upgrades of service, so you don't really notice anything. Uh, upgrading the containers uh, intelligently, that's more about knowing that, okay, what are, you know, I have so many services and containers, what are the interdependencies? You know, Nova needs MySQL, you, okay, you have a keystone, you have these custom metadata services and all this other stuff that has to be upgraded, right? So, and you also have these upgrade servers themselves that may need to be upgraded, or containers that may need to be upgraded, and then Ansible itself. So, just knowing, you know, all, all the inner workings so you can upgrade efficiently without, you know, doing something weird like upgrading the upgrade service in the middle of, of your upgrade and, and, and whatnot. For fault tolerant upgrades, a couple of things we were trying to do there is, like I mentioned, we, for our upgrade container, once again running kind of in, in triplicate here, we only have one upgrade container actually doing the upgrade at a time. The other two are kind of like in a, a, a mode watching to see if the other one uh, is still up. So the way that happens is the container that's doing the upgrade is actually writing to a etcd uh, backend key value store. If the others, you know, see that it's not updating that, they will take over and finish the upgrade. Simple, like, can, you know, clustering kind of stuff. The other thing we're trying to do there is, is let's say, worst case, all of those upgrade server or containers went away, having a fault-tolerant workflow engine so that, you know, you could recover exactly the, the moment where the upgrade stopped. Very important. Oh, monitoring. <laughs> monitoring, definitely a, a challenge uh, because we're saying here that, you know, we want to own everything from the hardware up to the OpenStack services themselves. You know, network, PDU, everything. So thinking about everything that can go wrong, you know, with, with a system and then saying, you know, th this is a failure or this could indicate an imminent failure. This is maybe more of a performance problem. And then those, that kind of thinking gets into like, okay, now I have to think about severity, you know? What is like absolutely critical? What is kind of critical? What, oh, it can wait and be done, you know, fixed, uh, you know, a little later. And, and then also, you know, having alerts to trigger off of that, right? Having all this integrated into a single pane of glass like Karthik had mentioned, you know? To have a dashboard that's meaningful, easy to understand exactly what's wrong with having to guess what something is, right? And then integrating that with, you know, a back-end support team, support chain, and saying what kind of 
failure or alert would we actually phone home about and integrating that with a phone home mechanism. And then when you start thinking that path, you think, well, now I want to say if something happens, you know, what is an initial diagnosis or what is an action that could be taken immediately, you know, if, if an alert was triggered or something, you know, so a support team can immediately, you know, jump on that. Um, and another thing that kind of hints at here too is, you know, trying to just log everything. So there's this wealth of data that's captured all in one place, in a single pane of glass. And when I say that, what, so I mentioned we're using Elasticsearch, for, you know, log stash, Kibana. Kibana is, you know, in that, that single pane of glass UI that we uh, were demonstrating. And so, you know, that's, that's a challenge to get all the logs in, keep them stored, but also to allow to, to be able to filter on things, right? You want to go in there and, and, and say, okay, let me see all the error severity messages or info severity messages. I want to be able to filter by host, by container type, by container type on a specific host, and all these things you, you want to slice and dice the logs. Because, I mean, even, even, even as a developer, just having a place to, to go, instead of having to log into 100 nodes or something to find one log that you thought was there is very powerful. So finally, uh, Keystone V3, and this is one that's, again, a little bit more towards uh, Kilo. Uh, so service is not understanding domain scope. Again, I'll call out Horizon here as an example. Um, so Horizon basically knew of uh, domain kind of like as a, a namespace, you could say, whereas like Jeremy at Coke or Jeremy at Pepsi could be distinguished. It could, it could also you know, talk V3 to Keystone at the time, uh, and generally understood V3 tokens, but didn't understand domain scope tokens. So kind of understanding the landscape at the time was a challenge, right? And along the same lines is not everything being V3 all the way, right? Some things being like, uh, you know, Nova to Neutron internal communication, V2. Uh, if just understanding the, you know, the, uh, how far things were integrated with V3 at the time, definitely a challenge. And, you know, for sake of time, we can't really talk about everything, <laughs> unfortunately, about the, the project. If there was something that specifically you wanted to know or drill down to. I mean, obviously we'll have a, a chance for you to come to the mic uh, and ask a few questions here in a bit, but more than likely, you know, to, to get the level and depth that you probably want, it might be good to stop by the EMC booth as, as, a, as a good chance to talk with a couple of members of the Project Caspian team who should be stationed there, you know, at all, at all times. So really good chance to get questions answered, even, even if, you know, Project Caspian if, if that wasn't something that sounded cool, which I think it's personally think it's cool, but I worked on it, so hey, I might be a little bit biased. Um, it's good to stop by the booth, even just to pick people's brains, you know, understand how, you know, working with OpenStack or Docker, you know, putting things in Docker containers, how that worked out. Of course, you can also stick around for the additional uh, sessions today, kind of pick and choose what you want to do. Uh, importantly, I would say stay tuned for EMC World next week because there will definitely be big uh, announcements about uh, Project Caspian. Um, actually, any questions? I, yeah, we should do questions, I guess, first before the. Uh, if you can come up to the mic, that would uh, help yeah. with the recording. I don't know if that's a good sign or a bad sign. No one has any questions. Um, like I said, the best chance, if, if there's something in your mind, a burning question, going to the EMC booth is a good chance to talk with someone in depth about a conversation more than you can probably get in like a couple of minutes uh, up here anyway. Um, I guess with that, do you want to? Yeah, why don't you? OK, so we're raffling off uh, the Amazon Echo. So I'll just call out the number so if you can come up here. 970316. 970316. Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> awesome. All right. Congratulations. Oh, yeah. I guess I should check it, right? Yeah, 97. Yeah, okay.
Cool. That's fine. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thanks Thank everybody you guys for, for attending. For coming to our session. It. Appreciate it.